everyone, welcome to episode number 493 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Move over off the shelf, chips. Bespoke Silicon is coming your way. Yes, my friends, this week my guest is Walt Hearn from ANSYS, and we're talking about the rise of Bespoke Silicon, collaboration in the EDA community, the need for open multi-physics platforms, and more. And a little later on, I check out the details of a new bacteria-powered wearable device. And the bacteria in question is actually dead. Yeah, you'll want to stick around for that one. So without further ado, let's welcome Walt to the show. Hi, Walt. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, no problem, Amelia. I, uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. So we're talking about bespoke silicon and 3DIC today, which ANSYS has talked a lot about in the past. But Walt, what exactly are these trends and what's behind this shift? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Amelia. What we're seeing in the industry is that companies have realized there's a tremendous value and competitive advantage by designing their own chips. An off-the-shelf chip just didn't give them the differentiation that they needed in their markets. So we're seeing across many verticals, including high-tech, automotive, and A&D, where they're designing their own chips to get this advantage. And look, Bespoke silicon ties into 3DIC. And when you think about what's driving 3DIC, it's the need for more powerful chips because of AI, ML, you know, you have 5G of autonomy and cloud computing. And a single SOC, you know, system on a chip, just can't meet the demands of those trends because of the size limitation. So we're seeing companies spreading that system out over multiple chips combined into one package. And that's given them an acceleration of speed and computing power they need to meet the growing performance requirements. So, Walt, what kind of companies do you see moving toward bespoke silicon? There are a lot of system and cloud companies like Tesla, Meta, Amazon, and Juniper Networks who are designing their own silicon. They're able to move towards bespoke silicon because they have enough resources to design their own chips you know, or they're agile enough, like a smaller startup to adapt, or they can organize themselves properly. You know, I'll give you an example, Amelia. Juniper Networks, a leader in secure artificial intelligent driven networks, they're designing their own silicon. Their networking chips are some of the largest, most complex chips in the semiconductor industry and are vital in all data transfer applications. They believe that by designing their own silicon, they will get a competitive advantage to accelerate the production of their high-speed networking chips. But as you know, designing silicon isn't easy. They needed the capacity for a full system analysis for a design with 60 billion transistors, and they were dealing with multiple ICs. So with ANSYS Red Hawk, Juniper took advantage of our powerful analytics to identify potential weaknesses and conduct what-if explorations to optimize power and performance. Because they had the right design solution, they were able to accelerate the power integrity sign-off and ultimately deliver a more reliable product to market. So, Walt, what do you see are some challenges around bespoke silicon and 3D ICs? The principal issue is that 3D IC, you know, it blurs the lines between three traditionally separate design disciplines. You You have the chip design team, the package design team, and the board design team. The three draw on different design tools, different data formats, terminology, manufacturing knowledge bases. And so now suddenly you're taking 3D IC is smashing those silos together while introducing new design challenges that require significant contributions from all three groups. When you think about bespoke silicon, you have new companies designing their own chips who are running into thermal and EMI issues that cause reliability concerns and potential performance compromises. This creates a greater challenge that demands multi-physics simulations. And you just can't solve these one by one anymore, right? 
You know, you need design tools to account for electromagnetics, thermal stress, and they need to be able to solve them concurrently because these physics will impact each other and the entire package design. These are really tough challenges and there's not really a simple solution, but a good start is creating a team environment with an open design platform that pulls together designers from different groups with a range of expertise required to address 3DIC. Realistically, not every designer can be an expert in the full range of physics that impact these systems. So it is essential to arm them with design tools, multi-physics simulation tools that automate the analysis as much as possible. That really makes sense. Now, well, do you see this as a fad or do you think this will become the norm in the future? You know, off the shelf chips will probably always have their place in the world, but bespoke silicon is not going anywhere. And 3D ICs, they offer too much advantages over SOCs. These companies will need to maintain their competitive advantage, especially in the area of big data, machine learning, and autonomy. You know, right now, Amelia, we're looking at least four significant areas that have changed the semiconductor industry. Number one, you know, bespoke chips are now designed by system companies with system design experience. The semiconductor and EDA companies like us, we need to make sure we're adjusting our offerings to accommodate this new way of thinking. Second, are the great demands placed on silicon technology? Chips need to do more with less. They have faster signal speeds. They have faster data transfer rates, and they need to use less power. You're not going to meet those needs without the need to deploy great silicon and design technology. Companies like Intel are rising to the challenges as they continue to drive Moore's Law and more than more techniques such as 3DIC. And third, it comes back to solving the multi-physics challenges that I talked about. Those are not only going to get harder and more necessary, as the chip complexity increases, so do the multi-physics challenges. And this final one, we are seeing the need for open multi-physics platforms. No single EDA company will meet all of the demands of bespoke silicon design. So there will need to be a collaboration across the EDA companies to provide the necessary solution. I think you'll agree with me on this one, Amelia. Those are a lot of big changes, but ANSYS, we're actually, we're excited about them. We have leading technology, we have the expertise and the open platform to not only help our customers survive these challenges, but to truly partner with them and empower them to survive in this new semiconductor landscape. Fantastic. I I see some really good things on the horizon, Walt. All right. Well, I think it's time for your off the cuff question, Walt. So a lot of us can't have our favorite foods these days for one reason or another. Either it's locked down, the restaurant's closed, it's on the other side of the world. So if you could have one meal right now, what would it be? (laughs) That's, uh, that's fantastic. So I grew up in, um, in Southern California, in San Diego, and right across the border, there's this small town called Puerto Nuevo. And Puerto Nuevo is on, the, is on the cliff of the Pacific. And it's this little fishing town that has fresh lobster, fresh handmade tor- tortillas with a beautiful ocean view. And so if it was the one thing I could have, I, I would be there enjoying some fresh lobster and uh, handmade tortillas. And that sounds absolutely amazing. Walt, sign me up. (laughs) Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you as well. I appreciate the time. So what if we could power wearable electronics with dead microbes? Well, new research coming out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst is showing that, yes, this can be done. They have developed a new biofilm that harnesses the corpses of dead bacteria to generate electricity from sweat. So, the bacteria at the center of this research is called Geobacter sulfurreducens, and it's actually one of several different microbes that are able to produce electricity, including during evaporation. Now, this recent research at UMass Amherst actually builds on previous research surrounding these microbes. 
but that previous research did run into a stumbling block that these types of microbes are actually quite difficult to keep alive. Well, this team from Amherst found that geobacter sulforeducins don't actually need to be alive in order to generate electricity. And even weirder, they work better when they're dead. So what are we really looking at here? Well, these microbes grow in matted colonies that are thin, about the thickness of a sheet of paper. Each microbe is connected to its fellow microbes using what this team refers to as a natural nanowire. So this team from Amherst took these mats and then with the help of a laser etched small circuits into them. Then they took the mats and put them between electrodes and then encased the whole thing in a porous soft polymer patch that can be worn on the skin. So the weirdness of this study doesn't stop at dead microbes. Oh no, this biofilm seems to actually work better than inorganic evaporation-based current generators, especially when it comes to salty water. According to the associated research paper, its structure also facilitates evaporation as well. Okay, what kind of performance are we really talking about here? Well, during these experiments, this technology was able to power a strain sensor measuring respiration, pulse, and other bodily signals for at least 18 hours. And it showed the same results on day 35 as it did on day 1. The associated research paper explains the results like this. It says, Our results demonstrate that biofilm sheets are an innovative, sustainably produced material capable of scalable power production from evaporation-based electricity generation. Other strategies for organizing microbial cells into highly channelized, high surface area materials may be feasible. The ubiquity of microorganisms and their proclivity for biofilm formation suggests possibilities for harvesting electricity using similar evaporation-based strategies in diverse environments. Wow. So dead microbes powering wearable devices. That's definitely a new one for fish fry. <laughs> if you want even more information about this groundbreaking and slightly gross research, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com, including a link to that research paper as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, you can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of August 5th, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.